I believe that somewhere in the midst of our life, we all stumble upon a defining moment. And a lot of people confuse this moment with something that they're born with. A defining moment is not something that you can inherit or something that you're just given. We are not defined by the things that we are born into. Instead, who we are is a collection of our memories, our personal experiences, and the connections that we make. I experienced my first defining moment around four years ago during the summer between seventh and eighth grade. I was born in India, and I moved to the United States when I was two years old. But I frequently travel back to visit my family, so I travel back and forth quite often. And it was on one of these trips during the summer between my seventh and eighth grade years that I first got involved with science research. Now, my grandfather in India is a politician, which means that he's always traveling to different parts of the country, attending conferences, visiting different communities. And that particular summer, I decided to join him. And we visited several rural communities in India where the local residents were facing a water crisis. People in these communities had to walk four miles every single morning to get water that wasn't even clean. Now, being a science student and being particularly interested in environmental science, I of course knew that not everyone in the world had access to clean water. But what I didn't know was how bad it was. Watching hundreds of people stand in the scorching heat every single morning to get water from the one available tap and witnessing the numerous overcrowded rural hospitals filled with people who are facing illnesses from water contamination really changed my perspective of the world. This unacceptable social injustice compelled me to want to find a solution to help the people in these communities. So for the rest of the summer, I spent my time researching water contaminants and existing filtration methods to try and come up with some way to develop a cheap water filter. And when I got back home, I got in touch with professors at the University of Arkansas in Little Rock and I found a way to develop these water filters using materials like terracotta clay and sawdust, which are abundant in India. And once I designed these filters, tested them, and perfected them, and was completely satisfied with them, I mailed them back to India to be distributed among the local residents. And upon receiving thank you letters back from the residents, I knew that I had found my passion. Using science research, my research, to make a difference in a struggling community excited me. So for the past five years, I've continued to do research in the environmental science field at various universities. And for my most recent research, I decided to focus on the growing energy demand. So with a show of hands, how many of you use a car or some sort of consumer electronic device like a DVD player? Okay, so if you do, then my research applies to you. Supercapacitors are energy storage devices that are used in everyday technologies like medical devices, automobiles, and electronics. They're great in terms of their portability, their long cycle lifetime, high energy density. They're better than batteries and are better at keeping up with the energy demand when compared to technologies like fuel cells or lithium ion batteries. But here's where they're not great. In order for a supercapacitor to actually work, it needs a great electrode. And ideally, this electrode would be conductive, it would be porous and have a high surface area and be tunable. But to meet these extensive requirements, the electrodes that are available in the market today are made from things like platinum, gold, nanodiamonds, and palladium. One ounce of platinum costs $1,000. But on top of this, you often have to replace the electrode to make sure that it can keep on keeping up with these energy demands. So now, you potentially have thousands of dollars that are being spent on one electrode for one supercapacitor for one device. 
to make supercapacitors more affordable and increase their applications, the cost of the electrode needs to be reduced. So through my research, I was able to find that carbon-based electrode materials have many of the properties that make them really good electrodes. They're chemically and thermally stable, exist in many forms, are tunable, but on top of that are naturally abundant and available at low costs. So through my research, I designed this carbon-based electrode using natural materials that I found in my pantry, literally. I used materials like tea powder, molasses, and tannin in a commercial microwave so that my reaction didn't have any negative environmental effects. And my electrodes last longer than most of the electrodes that are available in the market today and have 90% of the efficiency rates as the more expensive platinum-based electrodes. But the best part, my electrode costs less than $1. Thank you. <laughs> and I want you to think about that, because even though the existing electrodes are so expensive, supercapacitors are already so widely used in military technology, in medical devices, and in commercial applications like cars. Imagine what would happen if my less than $1 electrode was implemented into existing supercapacitors. Imagine how much cheaper everyday products would become. This could revolutionize the energy industry. The applications of supercapacitors would grow beyond imagination, and the cost of the electrode would no longer be a limiting factor in the research and implementation. Now, over the course of this, my journey hasn't really been an easy one. You know, science research is not a quick and easy process that'll automatically yield results. In fact, when I first started doing research in 2014, I didn't have access to a sophisticated laboratory. I was 13 years old when I first started, but I didn't let my age deter me in my interest to pursue science research. This project alone took me around 10 months and I didn't see any indication of success until the fifth month. And in fact, I still remember the first time I walked into a sophisticated laboratory my freshman year of high school. Let me tell you, the number of incorrect measurements I did that first month, the number of test tubes that I broke, it was a mess. And I was terrified. I mean, partly because I was afraid that I'd destroy million dollar technology, but also because I wasn't used to the idea of doing science research. I wasn't entirely comfortable with the fact that my initial plan might not be my final plan. I wasn't okay with failing to get to that eventual success. I didn't like that I wasn't understanding everything I was reading in these academic science papers. I still remember the first time I read a full-on academic science paper from a peer-reviewed journal. I didn't understand what half of the words on the page meant. And so I tried to devise a color coding system to kind of help make it easier. I decided that I was going to highlight everything I perfectly understood in yellow, everything I didn't understand at all, all the organic chemistry jargon in pink, and whatever I didn't highlight, well, I'd have to go back and look at that as well. At the end of that first reading, this is how the page looked. You can see that most of it is either pink or not highlighted at all. But despite this, I kept on going, I kept on persevering, and I kept on doing science research. And as the years went by, there was less pink and more yellow on the pages, and I slowly began to accept that it was okay to not get the answer on the first try. It was okay to stumble and fall because the path to achieving your dreams is not an easy one. But my research isn't about the fact that I was recognized at the biggest science fair in the world or the fact that I was named to the Forbes 30 under 30 list at 17. It is about how I found my passion through science research. It is about how I discovered what I wanted to do for the rest of my life and it is about me finding what makes me feel alive. So my advice here for everyone in the audience today 
is to go out and find what makes you feel alive. Don't let things like your age or the people who may not support you stop you from pursuing your interests and your dreams. As Oprah Winfrey put it, feel the power that comes from focusing on what excites you. Thank you. <laughs>